Hello everyone, my name is Julie Wheelwright. I'm a historian and author of Sisters in Arms, Female Warriors from Antiquity to the New Millennium. And I'd like to welcome you today to a discussion about the extraordinary women of the 18th century who swapped their skirts for trousers and ventured off to the high seas and even to fight on foreign battlefields. We're going to talk about how and why they did it, what became of them afterwards, and the meaning of their stories. So along the way, I'm going to be offering a few details about the lives of Marine Hannah Snell, an English woman, soldier and sailor Marianne Talbot, also English, and the pirates Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, one English, one Irish, who all, who all feature in the Man Up exhibition. But first, a bit of history about the female warriors of antiquity, known as the Amazons. Throughout the history of warrior women, who were often but not always disguised as men, is woven an enduring mythology. It's almost like a kind of founding myth. And it stems from the Greeks, who decorated vases, sculptures, and friezes with images of these Amazonian war women who were ferocious foreigners, who mounted horses to hunt and to fight with arrows and spears. In the slide we can see here is an image from a vase dating from 470 BC with one such Amazonian warrior, and you can see her hair is tied back, but she's wearing trousers and she's carrying a shield. Despite the trousers and the shields, however, these women were often depicted as glamorous goddesses who, though usually defeated in battle by the superior, of course, male gods, displayed an unfeminine courage and skill. The reality was that far from godlike creatures, these were women of the nomadic Scythian tribes <clears throat> from the area around the Black Sea who were simply raised in a more egalitarian society where unlike Greek women, they were allowed to chase game, to fight men, to ride on horseback and to wander at will. So you can imagine these Greek warriors saw these figures, these female figures in battle. So they're looking at them from a distance. The women are mounted on horseback and they also hear stories about them from their household slaves, and often the slaves are speaking in languages uh, that are unfamiliar to the Greeks, and so something gets lost in translation. And at the end of, at the, end of the day, these uh, Greeks could simply not understand that real women could perform such tasks. And so they turned them into these supernatural figures, and so the myth of the warrior women was born. So while the mythic Amazons would continue to appear in popular accounts of military and seafaring histories for the next few centuries, they actually had their real life counterparts from the Iceni queen Boudicca to Zenobia, queen of Palmyra, to Joan of Arc, who um, actually reappears in the early 21st century as a really important symbol for the British suffragettes, and the wife of King Henry VIII, course, Catherine of Aragon. And although these female military leaders were rare, they demonstrated that women were capable of commanding armed forces and of negotiating political power. They proved that women could do strategy, they could do logistics, and they also weren't going to faint away in the face of organized violence. Below decks and on campaign trails, there were hundreds more women in European armies and navies who supported services ranging from the sourcing of food, often they were known as sutlers, and processing and serving food, um, selling it sometimes, to the cleaning, mending, and making of clothes, to nursing and arm supplies. So by the 18th century, when Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, who were members of the notorious Captain Jack Rackham's pirate crew, were tried, on piracy charges in the High Court of Admiralty in Jamaica in 1720, the British public were already very familiar with women in arms. But of course, female pirates, even in a rare field, were quite extraordinary. Both Mary Reed and Anne Bonny were born illegitimate. And so they actually began their lives as social outcasts. 
uh, to compound matters, both of them, ironically, were raised as boys for pragmatic reasons. In Mary's case, her mother had been seduced and then abandoned by a sailor. And when her elder brother died a few months later, Mary was given his name. And according to Captain Johnson's History of the Pirates, Pirates, this was to persuade uh, Mary's, sorry, Mary's grandmother that this grandson had survived and therefore she should continue paying for his upkeep. At the age of 13, Mary became a servant to a French lady, but again, I'm quoting Captain Johnson here, growing bold and strong, she quit domestic service and signed on with a man of war and later became a cadet in Flanders during the War of Spanish Succession. So Mary goes on to have many adventures, uh, which includes marriage to a Flemish soldier and a brief stint as a pub lady in Breda. But after his death, she joins an infantry regiment. And while sailing to the Caribbean, that ship was overtaken by English pirates, which led to joining Captain Jack's ship. And, and there she met the Irish-born Anne Bonny, who had first assumed male disguise in colonial America to escape from a rocky marriage and to elope to sea with Captain Jack. And according to Johnson again, she was a, of a fierce and courageous temper. It was, certainly that, it was certain that she was so robust once that, wa that when a young fellow would have lain against her will, she beat him so that he lay ill of it a considerable time. So you do wonder if female readers weren't applauding Anne's show of fierce temper in this account, because here we see a young woman physically fighting off a potential rapist, and rather than being accused of inviting the young fellow's assault, she's actually praised for her courage in seeing him off. And this, of course, is, is the kind of stuff out of which a pirate is made. Um, but Captain Jack, Captain Johnson's account, despite its positive portrayal of the female pirates, emphasizes that ultimately crime doesn't pay. In the dock at the High Court in 1720, both women pled the belly. So in other words, this is a reference to both of them being pregnant and therefore having a legitimate reason to stay their execution. Eventually, Mary Reed would die in prison, and while Anne was released, she disappeared from public view. So while, while Mary has died, Anne has disappeared, we still have this account from Captain Johnson, and this is the testimony of Dorothy, Tom, Dorothy Thomas, who kind of immortalizes and, and emphasizes some of the tropes of the Amazonian warrior. So here, they're wearing men's clothes, the jacket, long trousers, handkerchief, they're carrying weapons, the machete and the pistol. And also there's this kind of murderous, violent attitude that comes out here, um, which really sets them apart from other women. So if swashbuckling pirate heroines were a rarity throughout the later 18th century, tales of other female warriors grew in numbers and in popularity. They were featured in many, many ballads, in stage plays, and in chapbooks, and in newspaper accounts. Among the most famous, of course, was Hannah Snell, who's featured here in her tri-cornered hat and a frock coat on the cover of the Gentleman's Magazine of July 1750. And this was the summer that she became the first British warrior heroine to bring her life on stage, performing at New Sadler's Wells Theatre in London, where she sang ditties and led a group of female Marines in a series of regimental marches. One tribute with its saucy overtones re reveals how her story was turned into an anecdote, which plays on the public's amusement that Hannah could so skillfully disguise herself amongst a naval crew. And one of the things about these stories that I'm always asked is how did they get away with it? And I think you can see here that, um, you know, Hannah wearing a pair of trousers um, in a uniform, doing everything that the other men are doing was a way of ensuring an identity and a disguise in and of itself. A lot of the women also describe things like using 
um, uh, one very famous uh, contemporary example, Christian Davies, um, used what she called a silver painted over urinary instrument, which was actually like a kind of uh, shiwi um, that she would use and was actually made for men who were suffering from venereal disease to help her urinate. Other women were just very careful about their behavior, about when and where they uh, would urinate or <laughs> move their bowels in the morning, when and where and how they washed, and of course people were washing less often. And as far as we see here in this quote, the reference to the bedmate, well, people did a lot of bed, bed sharing in the 18th century. So we might, we might also ask why she did it. Like many female warriors, it's difficult to really know what her motives were for enlisting because she was actually illiterate and her popular memoir was written by her publisher. And when you read a lot of these accounts, you can see that they are sort of literary tropes that, that get employed, the same kind of themes come up in these stories. But as far as the biographical detail goes, we do know that she was born in 1723 to a military family in Worcester. And after, after the death of both of her parents, she went to London to live with her sister Susanna and her brother-in-law, whose name was James Gray. After several years, again, we have no reason, no reason, you know, for her living in London uh, with this couple is provided. But after several years, she decides to take her brother-in-law's name and enlist with Colonel John Geis's 6th Regiment Foot, in other words, an infantry outfit at Coventry, which was near her family home, so perhaps she had connections there. And for this initial period, she served between four months and two years before deserting. So what Hannah may have left to avoid detection, which again was something that female warriors were often forced to do, um, and she returned to London. In 1747, she enlisted again to serve under Colonel Fraser's Regiment of Marines. She sailed on the sloop Swallow and was engaged in the First Carnatic War, which established Britain's presence in India, and she was wounded at Pondicherry. Um, she claimed to have spent several months in a hospital in Cuddalore uh, between 1748 and 49 with wounds to her groin, bullet wounds to her groin, without being discovered. So um, her contemporary biographer, Matthew Stevens, however, has done some really impressive archival research, and he suggests that the muster of the Eltham, which you can see here, um, the ship on which James Gray was serving, survived the 1748 siege of Pondicherry unchanged. So therefore, did Hannah really have bullets to her groin? Quite probably not. Um, but the muster does reveal that in 1749, James was admitted to Cuddalore Hospital for two months, and Stevens suggests that James was actually suffering from scurvy because there were 20 other crew members who were hospitalized with the same disease. In any case, Hannah managed to survive. Uh, she returned to Portsmouth where she was paid off on the 25th of May 1750, and then she makes her way to London. After disclosing her secret to her fellow Marines and you know, turning down several proposals of marriage, she was able to collect a pension from the Duke of Cumberland, who accepted her certificate of wounding. So again, you can see why this story about the bullet wounds to the groin was so important. And she made, she made, and the, the Duke uh, made her an out pensioner at the Royal Chelsea Hospital on 30 pounds a year. But after a brief spell of publicity, and she did go on to marry three times and have children, she eventually fell on hard times. Rather than living out a comfortable old age, she ended her careworn life, probably suffering either from mental illness or dementia, and died in 1792 at Bethlehem Hospital, also known as Bedlam, at the age of 69. So although poor Hannah had been largely forgotten, her story was immortalized through her biographers, and it proved hugely influential to later generations of female warriors, one of whom was the mysterious Marianne Talbot, whose story first appeared in a Times newspaper report of 1799. So uh, Marianne was interviewed in a Middlesex hospital where she claimed to be recovering from a knee injury, an unhealed wound she suffered at the naval battles where she fought disguised as a man following her lover to sea, and the Times report sort of lists the several ships that she sailed on. 
Five years later, her autobiography appeared with further details of her, her extraordinary life. And as it happens, it was published by uh, Kirby, who um, was a man for whom she was a domestic servant. So there may have been, well, obviously there seems to have been some arrangement between them. Like the pirates Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, she claimed to be an illegitimate child, but attached herself to the English aristocracy through her purported father, Lord William Talbot, an MP and member of the Privy Council. But as her mother died giving birth to her, supposedly the youngest of 16 children, she was passed from one unscrupulous guardian to another. Nine years she spent in posh girls' boarding schools, uh, at, and at the age of 14, her guardianship passed to one Captain Essex Bowen of the 82nd Regiment of Foot Gain Infantry Division. And like other female warrior stories, and who sometimes describe how their abuse by a stepfather or employer um, persuaded them to enlist, Talbot recalled that Bowen had pressed her into military service to satisfy his sexual needs. As her memoir recounts, intimidated by his manners and knowing that I had no friend near me, I became everything he desired. Uh, when Captain Bowen was ordered to the West Indies, Marianne became John to serve as a footboy aboard his ship, the Crown. But here, Talbot's memoir diverges from the recorded history, and according to naval historian Suzanne Stark, there is no officer by the name of Essex Bowen in the army list of 1791-96. to The 82nd Regiment did not exist in 1792 and was not sent to the West Indies until three years later, again three years after Talbot claimed to have gone there, and the Crown Transport in which Captain Bowen and Talbot were supposed to have sailed in 1791 was then en route back to England from India. So these are only a few discrepancies in Talbot's memoir, but it actually casts a great deal of doubt on its authenticity. But while we may sort of wonder whether Marianne Talbot's account is actually uh, a legitimate one, um, there were certainly dozens of women serving aboard um, ships in the 18th century. And one of the best documented cases, and I would really recommend you look at the wonderful reprint of um, The Female Shipwright by Mary Lacey, um, is an account of a, a Kent domestic servant who spent eight years aboard naval ships as an apprentice disguised as William Chandler. And although she successfully maintained her disguise until exposed in 1771, uh, after which she became a master builder in London, she actually describes an account with an encounter with another woman aboard ship who was the lover of her messmate John Grant and with whom she became very close. As she says, the young woman and I were very intimate, and as she was exceedingly fond of me, we used to play together like young children. Our messmates believed we, we were too familiar together, but neither of us regarded their surmises. And if they said anything to her, she told them that if anything like, like what they suspected had passed between us, the same should be practiced in the future. In fact, John Grant became so jealous of William Chandler that um, he actually assaulted him for flirting with his girlfriend. And this, of course, may have been another motive for a woman to disguise herself as a man, to enjoy sexual relationships with women, as William Chandler certainly did. And in fact, Lacey's memoir is full of domestic encounters with domestic servants who attempt to seduce the apprentice shipwright, and he recounts many encounters with many loving girlfriends. So while the Chawton House exhibition focuses on the glorious tradition of female warriors, and here we see a couple of examples of female tars, um, illustrations from uh, chat books. Um, we also know that there are fictional counter, there are also fictional accounts um, from the 18th century. And these stories really lived on not only into the 19th century where we had a proliferation of female soldiers and sailors during the Napoleonic conflicts. Um, there were an estimated 400 women um, who fought during the American Civil War and they were even, there are even celebrated cases of disguised women and actually um, undisguised, many, many undisguised uh, women soldiers from the First World War. So they lived on in the fictional imagination, inspiring young women to take on adventures to earn their own money, 
to participate in a national cause, to become involved in politics, and to seek out relationships with other women. Sometimes they were fleeing an abusive home, they were escaping poverty, they got caught up in a conflict, or they wanted to pursue a trade. But whatever their reasons, they were endlessly interesting and have much to teach us about the lived realities of women throughout history.